All right, good afternoon, everybody. So, I want to start with a little exercise. I want everybody to take a look to your left. Take a look to your right. There's a good chance that on either side of you, two of the three of you over the next three years will be hit with some sort of ransomware attack. The one that isn't hit with the ransomware attack is probably the one triggering it. So, no, kidding, kidding, probably. So, all right. The reality is, you know, we are, we are living in a world where cyber attacks are becoming increasingly common. And for a lot of us here that deal with infrastructure, that deal with data, you can think of us very much as we're plumbers. Our entire job is to make sure that everything keeps flowing inside our organizations. And it's, the, it's, it's, it's a job that no one gives us a lot of credit for until, of course, as with your plumbing, it backs up, then all of a sudden everybody notices. So the goal here is really to help you get ready for what's, what's that next round of cyber attacks? How can you make yourself secure? So what we're going to talk through today is, is really, again, some of the steps that we at Druva take, some of what we see from our customer base, and then, of course, we're going to bring up a customer, uh, uh, David from Amgen, who's going to talk through his perspective and what Amgen's doing. But let's start with the beginning. Yeah, everyone likes to start with statistics. Now, the statistic up here that is probably most important to me is the 92%. Because 92% of people we've surveyed have said, we've got a well-run infrastructure. We've got good tools. We run it efficiently. We feel like we're on top of things. There is almost nothing that we think is completely wrong in our environment. And yet, half of those people who said that they were confident about their infrastructure were hit with a ransomware attack and lost data. So think about that. It's well run. There's no glaring gaps. You feel like you're on top of everything. You're managing the industry trends. You're doing everything you're supposed to do, and you're still losing data. So what does that mean? As we dove deeper with some of the respondents to the survey, what we found out was you know, we're past the point of you could work smarter or you could work harder with your existing tools. It's not about doing a better job with what we've had for the last 20 years. You've got to start approaching this differently. Because the people that are attacking you are not using the same tricks and approaches and techniques that they've used for the past five years. Everything is constantly evolving. So again, this isn't a question of, can you just work harder to get out of this? Can you just throw 10% more elbow grease in to keep yourself safe? Everything is different, and you've got to approach it as such. Now, who am I? So I'm Stephen Manley. I'm the CTO at Druva. Who's Druva? Well, Druva is a SaaS data protection company. So think of this as you've got data, and you've got data in all sorts of places. It could be in your endpoints, desktops, laptops. It could be in your data center and your remote offices. It could be in Microsoft 365, Salesforce, Google Workspace. And of course, it could be in the cloud, like AWS and other public clouds. You've got data everywhere. Data sprawl is part of our lives. Druva says, well, let us protect that data for you because it's really hard to try to manage all that on your own, trying to back that up, you know, do cybersecurity of your data, do disaster recovery of your data, keep, keep track of governance. It's so much work for you to try to do that on your own. Let us do it for you. So that, that's, that's where we live. We live in working with customers to make sure that their data is backed up, resilient, and secure. Now, in terms of the scope and scale, so, so you know, where, where are we coming from? So, so the first thing is, we run about 4 billion backups a year. So this isn't something where we've just started doing this last week, and we've got a couple of backups running every once in a while. We run at a massive scale. We're in 16 regions around the world, and we have about 300 petabytes under management. That's 300 petabytes of deduplicated data, so you know, imagine, you know, sort of scale that out in terms of how much we're managing in terms of our customer space. I say this only to, to, to give you context that what we're working on is at a very large scale. And we're one of the largest users of things like DynamoDB, of S3 storage, et cetera. So as I walk through some of what we do to secure our data, you may look at some of it and say, wow, that seems extreme. A lot of that is because every day I live my life on the edge. So I want to start first with what do we do to protect ourselves? So uh, every time I meet with potential customers, every time I meet with organizations, the first question usually is not, 
tell us more about Druva's functionality. It's tell us what you do so I can learn and see if I should be doing something differently in my cloud native environment. Am I missing a trick? Is there something obvious that I'm not keeping up with? So the first part of this talk, I'm going to walk through some of what we do at Druva to make sure that our environment and our data is secure. The second part of the talk, I'm going to again talk about what our customers are seeing in terms of ransomware attacks, in terms of security threats, and what we're recommending to them as best practices. So again, first part, deep dive into you know, how does Druva do security. Second part, what we're seeing from our customer base. Now, when you think about protecting yourself from a ransomware attack, you know, there, there's, there's really two sides to the coin. And, the, and, and what we find is people generally skew towards either one side or the other. So if I'm talking to security people, they're usually worried about this, this primary environment. How do I secure that primary environment? How do I keep you know, the malware from getting in? How do I make sure that that primary environment is always running? Of course, when I talk to the backup team, they're thinking about how do I make sure my backups are secure? How do I make sure I fit in any part of ransomware recovery? So again, you need to be able to have both sides of these coins. And in an ideal world, and I know that's not always where we live, but in an ideal world, we need to stop having the silos between the security team and the backup team. Because if I go five years ago, you know, the idea from the backup team was always, look, I need security to review this. Oh my God, they're such a pain. All they do is just bring up objections. I'm just trying to get my job done. And the security team basically looked and said, the backup team aren't those the people that sit in the basement that couldn't get a better job, and so that's why they're backup people. We really need to shift this to say, we're, again, we're all on the same team. Backups need to be secure. And we'll talk a little bit about how backups can actually help you protect and recover your, protection, your production environment. But again, I want to start first with that production environment. What are some of the things you do to protect a production cloud environment at scale? Now, the first thing is, I mentioned what Druva does. Druva protects customers' data for them. So you can imagine, you know, 10, 10 years ago or so when we started going to customers, and we'd say, what we're going to do is the data, the most important part of your environment, we're going to back that up to the cloud running on top of AWS, and we're going to hold that data for you. And the initial response of most people is, that's great. It's been such a pain trying to manage backups and capacity plan and do all that sort of thing, and nobody enjoys doing that. So it's great that you're doing this for me. Pause. Beat, beat, beat. Wait a minute. You're holding our data. Does that mean you can look at it? So the first step that we have to do with any customer is to say, yes, I am holding your data, and no, I can't look at it. And that has everything to do with encryption. So it was critical for us to say, we have to encrypt the data in a way that you, the customer, are holding the key so that all that data that I'm storing is inaccessible. It's inaccessible to me as a Druva employee. And of course, if something terrible were to happen in our environment and that data were to get exfiltrated, we couldn't do any, you know, they couldn't see anything from that data either. And just to be doubly sure, what we're going to do is we're going to create sort of this deduplicated at scale file system that splits out the data from the metadata, metadata sitting in DynamoDB, data sitting in, in S3, so that even if someone got access, and even if they could figure, figure out a way to get the key from the, from the customer, it would still just be a bunch of jigsaw puzzle blocks. So we focused a whole lot on how do I make sure that if something happened, the customer's data would not be exfiltrated, would not be compromised. Now, you as a customer, you, you as an organization might think, well, sure, that's, that's a problem with a SaaS vendor like Druva. You have to worry about whether that data would get compromised. But me and my organization, I just need an S3 bucket because I trust all my internal employees. All right, so message number one, do not trust your internal employees for two reasons. First, how many of you have multiple organizations within, within your company? Show of hands, you know, more than one organization. Right, so quite a few of us. And a lot of organizations want to make sure that you know, the data from Group X is not accessible by Group Y and vice versa. The second one, of course, is most cyber attacks now are trying to get a hold of your access permissions so that they can go poking around your data. So while you know, AWS does an awesome job of encrypting your, your, your buckets, your S3 buckets by default now, making sure that your data is encrypted. 
I would strongly encourage you to think about making sure that you are managing the keys from a source side. Because if that environment is compromised and someone gets in and tries to move laterally, fine. You can do get requests from the bucket. But if you can't have the key that decrypts it, then the data is still safe. So while I think about this at a massive scale across thousands of customers in a multi-tenant environment, the same principles apply. And having a layer, and I'm not saying you have to build a whole custom deduplicated file system the way we did, but you need to have some sort of layer on top of the access to S3, in my opinion. Every company that we see doing this well at scale because it allows you to have better logging. It allows you to have better access permissions. It allows you to make sure that you are on top of what's happening in your environment. So while it seems really great and easy just to say, we're going to give you an S3 bucket, go have fun, you really want to think about having layers on top of that. Because if you design it that way, it gives you flexibility and control and portability for the future. So that was our step one. Our step one was make sure that the data, if it was exfiltrated, would not be compromised. But of course, you know, one of the things that occurs to me, and this started to pop up a couple years ago, is quantum computing. Now, I get quantum computing is not widespread at this point. But guess from the audience, why is quantum computing so scary to me when I think about encryption? Exactly. They've already shown that quantum computers can, can crack these encrypted uh, algorithms in a matter of hour or less. So while the bad guys may not have quantum compute now, if they can exfiltrate your data now, a couple years from now when it's widespread, all of a sudden that data that you said, well, that's not a big deal, it's encrypted. No one could do anything with that anyway, that changes. So encryption is necessary, but it is no longer sufficient. And it's not something you can wait to plan for when quantum comes, because again, the bad guys are exfiltrating data now in the hopes of being able to use it in the future. And I don't know about you, but it's not, in our company, it's not only the new data that's valuable. A lot of the most important IP, a lot of the most important information is older. So just because it's old doesn't mean it doesn't have value. So we started to say, all right, we need more than just encryption. Encryption's great, but we need more. And so we started to look at it from a platform perspective. So how do you create a highly resilient platform? And of course, the first thing that occurred to us is, well, all right, you know, let, let's be honest, you know, we can't trust our own employees. It just can't, right? It's, it's, it's the modern world. So how do you create a system that defends against you know, internal rogue attacks or against somebody that has compromised credentials. So when we looked at the environment, the first thing we said is, OK, so you're going to want to run in multiple regions. Now, in our case, that's partially because, of course, there's data residency requirements, sovereignty requirements. If you've got organizations running in multiple locations, you've got to run in multiple regions. And of course, because you're running it as a service, you're going to want to run across multiple availability zones in those regions to keep the service resilient. That's all the basics. But then we started to, again, look at how do we defend the, the environment. And so the first thing is anything on the back end, anything that has to do with that data, with the processes that are running, the part that really matters to you, that's all in a private subnet, highly restricted, with, you know, with very restrictive security groups. And the only way you can log in, there's no SSH. And, 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 and every time I say this, I, I, I've, I've, I've now finally learned to say, well, you guys clearly don't have SSH running in your environment. And the number of organizations that I meet that their heads immediately hang down and go, well, <laughs> no SSH. Everything only MFA, everything only VPN into that environment. Because you can't leave this stuff exposed. This is the crown jewels of your environment. And so there is no direct access. And so you do all those. And again, you go through the AWS you know, sort of best, best you know, well-architected reviews, and you make sure you're running properly. And you know what? It's not enough. Because one of the things we figured out very quickly is you can have all the tools, you can have all the right architecture, but it falls apart if you don't have the people and the process. Because as much as tools are awesome, as much as the technology is great, as much as it's continually evolving, without people in process, you get a whole bunch of alerts that no one's watching, and the bad guys are running rampant in your environment. And so some of the people in process that we institute, and we institute religiously, is first and foremost, who's got access to what? 
And it seems like the simplest thing. You, know, you should be constantly on a weekly basis monitoring who's got access to the production environment. But the number of organizations I talk to that say, well, we do it quarterly, we do it half yearly, or I think we do it, is staggering. And it's not just because you don't want to leave legacy permissions around or you don't want to leave permissions around for John who just got demoted because he wasn't showing up to work and he's probably a little disgruntled and he might do some really bad things. It's because when ransomware attackers come in, the first thing they try to do is create backup credentials for themselves so they can get into your environment whenever you want. So it's not just about getting rid of the people that are no longer supposed to have access, it's about making sure that you're not seeing something unusual. So you have to be constantly monitoring that environment. And then the second thing, and, and this, is, this is 101, and again, this is the sort of thing that I go around to organizations and everybody just goes, yeah, we know. And that is the L word. You need logs. And it's so boring. And it's so mundane. And it's so obvious. And it's so rarely done at scale. The number of places I've gone to where I say, oh, so what kind of, well, we keep a rotating week of logs. Well, that's great, because you know, the average attack has a lifespan of around a quarter now. But sure, that last week will be great, so you can see the very last thing that they did. Not how they got in, not how they spread, but you can see how they, you know, they you know, played havoc for that last week. You need to have the logs. You need it to be centralized. You need a constant, coherent way of managing the logs. Because when it comes time to assess that incident, the first thing everyone's going to ask for, whether it's an external incident response team or your own people, is what happened and when I need access to the logs. And so we are maniacal about, you know, using, uh, about the logs, you know, using, using all AWS CloudTrail and a bunch of other tools. And again, these all seem obvious. These are all the basics. But most people aren't doing them. But again, we live in a world where we are constantly under attack. We've got thousands of customers running billions of backups, holding hundreds of petabytes of data. It's not surprising. People are coming after Druva. And so some, what, what do we add on top of that? So the first thing we added is you need an incident response plan. I'm going to talk about that more when we get into ransomware. But again, I, you would be shocked at the number of people that have not done any sort of tabletop, any sort of practice of, when we get hit with ransomware, and again, two out of three of you in the next three years really will, what are we going to do? Who's going to be sitting at the table? Who's going to be able to make the judgment calls? Where are we going to recover to? How are we going to be able to scale up to do the incident response? What kind of external firm are you, we using? What's our PR plan going to be? All those sorts of questions people don't have. You need to be able to have a plan in place. And then there's some other things we've done, again, technologically speaking. So Route 53. So I'm guessing most people here, you know, you've got to be using Route 53, right? Show of hands if you're using Route 53 in your environment. Right? It's like the service that everyone has. So one of the things that we, we've been doing with Route 53, one, again, constantly reviewing. But the second is most organizations do a really good job of monitoring who's coming in, blocking who's coming in. Most of us do a really terrible job of watching what? Who's going out? Modern ransomware attacks aren't just about deleting or encrypting your data. They're also about exfiltrating your data. So by watching where the DNS is going, watching where the connections are going outbound is critical. Because if you're seeing something unusual, that's usually a sign that something really bad is happening in your environment. Maybe it's an internal employee. Maybe it's a mistake. Maybe it's an attack. But it's worth it. And, and, and again, I will say, your organization, your engineering teams, your development teams will fight you tooth and nail. And they will explain that it makes their life unfair. And how could you possibly do this to me? And it doesn't matter because they're wrong. Because it all seems not important until it's the most important thing possible because it kept them safe. So if they say, well, it's going to cost me uh, a little bit of extra time and hassle, well, imagine if you're down for two or three weeks recovering from a ransomware attack. Is that going to hurt? So you've got to make sure that the, you know, you've got to hold a firm line. And then, of course, you know, we push towards IMDS v2. Again, nothing wrong with v1. 
but especially in terms of things like the server side, you know, fraudulent activity, you know, we're seeing more and more of that uh, coming into our environment. You know, the V2 really helps you know, make you resilient across that with the session-oriented architecture, protection against rogue WAFs, those sorts of things. So again, you know, constantly staying on the cutting edge because the attackers, once they see that these, these walls are cut off, they're just evolving to find another one. So we're constantly saying, all right, what's the next wave? Well, you know, the, the, the next next wave for us, of course, is you know, you've got to be constantly monitoring your production environment. Because again, we, we're a software company. Virtually all of you out there in some form or another are at this point software companies, probably software companies running in the cloud. Your business is depending on the software. Whether you make light bulbs or whether you grow fruit or whether you're a data protection company, your business runs on the software that you've got outstanding. And so in our case, and I'm not advocating saying, oh my God, you know, this is not a, a vendor pitch for these other vendors, they, they, they are who we use. But we use Orca to constantly monitor the, the production environment to look for the sorts of things in the active world. And of course, because we're generating software, it's really important to keep evaluating your software, especially because of software supply and chain attacks. You've got to be monitoring to see if anything's coming in because developers, again, developers think about security about as often as they think about testing, which is not very often. I found this, this module, this library in the, uh, on the internet, it solved my problem, so I plugged it in. Well, cool, it was written by a nation state that's trying to plumb and, uh, and, and, and dig into all our information, but thank God it took two days off your development schedule. So you've got to assume that your developers are going to make bad decisions, not because they're bad people, but because they don't care about security because their job is to get the product shipped on time. And of course, the last piece and the thing that we struggle with, you know, I, I, there's always another battle, is you've got your production environment, you've got your crown jewels, we've got our crown jewels where we run our production environment, where we're storing our customers' data, and we are watching that like a hawk. So of course, if I were an attacker, would I go after, would I go head on into that environment? Of course not. That'd be crazy. You never go after the single most defended area. What am I going to go after? Guess, if I were an attack, where do we see most of our attacks actually coming at us from? What do they target? Test? Our lab. Exactly. Because that's where the engineers, they run rogue. That's where IT and, the, and, and security, we don't quite have as much influence because we don't have the money, we don't have the people, we don't have the time. How much can you watch? You can't watch everything. And so we see more attacks coming into our lab environment than any other part of the organization. Well, it's just the lab environment. The ability of these organizations to move laterally once they get in is terrifying. And so one of the things that we advocate for is you've got to watch it all. Now I get it. You know, you're not going to put the same level of security on every part of your environment. And we are constantly figuring out how do we balance that, that cost versus, versus functionality uh, you know, balance. But it is critical that when you look at your organization, don't just focus on the crown jewels. Because the attacks always come from somewhere else. Now, the most obvious one in these, of course, was the Colonial Pipeline. They didn't attack the core pipeline. They attacked the billing system. Well, it's just the billing system. How could that be a problem? Well, I'm not shipping you any oil if I can't bill you. So they effectively brought the pipeline down because they found a dependency that could bring them down. So again, you're not going to be able to put the security in everything, but you do need to think about what your security plan is across the board. And so when we think about this, you know, and again, when we talk to our customers, when we talk internally, what are the things that we focus on? The first is, you know, if we got hit in any part of our environment, can we successfully recover without paying? Because the moment we say, no, no, we'd probably have to pay there, that means we messed up somewhere. That means we've made a bad decision. The second one is, recovery doesn't just mean I get the data back in three weeks. If I can't get it back in time for the business to be up and running, then that doesn't count. You know, there's not sort of this, well, it took us six months and we handcrafted the data back together using, you know, God knows what. We're, we succeeded. That's not success, right? Enough success is like that and you're out of business. And you've got to make sure that you're getting the data back. 
So, so this is how we measure ourselves. This is how we run ourselves. Now, I want to talk a little bit about then, you know, and again, hopefully some of these are, are things that you can apply in your environment. Again, don't trust your internal users. Think about source-side encryption. Think about layers on top, of your, on top of your data. Think about being able to orchestrate there. The second is, think about how are you managing your platform? How are you managing who has access to production? And then, of course, how are you constantly turning the ratchet on the network security, on the administrator security, on the user security, so that you can be sure that your environment is safe? But now I want to talk about the other side. So, so of course, we go around to our customers. You know, we have a service, and, and we tell them, this is how we secure our service. The second is, how do we help them secure their environment? And so the very first thing most organizations don't think about is you know, you've got to be able to, again, protect your data in separate accounts. Now, now, some of this seems obvious. For those of you who have been in the backup world for a long time, there's the three, two, run rule, right? Three copies, uh, at least uh, two different types of media, one of them being off-site. We've kind of modified that to say one should not just be off-site, but it should really be in a totally separate account, because again, if your primary account credentials get compromised, you know, it's pretty easy to then go, go after your backups. And so one of the things that we talk to people about is, so you've got a lot of important data now running in your VPC. You've got your EC2 instances with your EBS volumes. And a lot of, there's a lot of smart people who say, and, and we snapshot those because bad things can happen, right? Every one of us wakes up every day and think bad things happen and bad people do bad things. Well, with the bad things happening, those snapshots are awesome. They help you recover quickly. They get your, your application up and running again. It doesn't even require IT help. This is fantastic. Until, of course, your account gets compromised. At which point, your production's gone, your snapshots are gone, and there's a good chance your application and your business are gone. So you need to be able to create an alternate copy in a separate account. Now, there's, there's, there's multiple ways to do that. You can, of course, you know, use S3 object replication into, an, uh, into another account, into another region. Totally viable way of doing it. Another way to do it, of course, is you know, because the, the EBS team has created APIs, which makes it really easy to make backup copies into other locations, you know, organizations like Druva can help you basically make those copies off-site into a separate account, and we manage it for you. But no matter how you look at it, you're going to want to be able to create those copies. And you look, and you say, you know, again, what's my SLAs? What's my cost profile look like? You know, what kind of threats am I trying to protect against? How much am I willing to pay? And the right answer usually is some amount of local snapshots and some amount of off-site copies in a backup vendor like Druva. And it's funny because the number of people I meet that, uh, that say, wow, that is a revolutionary concept. For those of you who have been around the industry for a while, how many people remember NAS storage and NetApp and all that? The same thing. You got some local snapshots, you got your replica, and then you need an offsite backup. We're in the same world. The world doesn't change. We just have to remember how to play the same tune in a slightly different way in the cloud. The second threat, ransomware. I just want to walk you through some of the stories. So right now, we're helping customers, multiple customers a week, recover from ransomware attacks. Again, this is not something where, where you look and go, ah, it's a onesie twosie, it rarely happens. This is something that we are constantly helping people through. So anytime you hear someone say, well, ransomware, that's overhyped, that's either someone that's been hit <laughs> or someone that's been hit that doesn't know it. Because ransomware is, in fact, everywhere at this point. And so some of the lessons learned that we've seen, the first one is, again, you know, detection lags infection. Like I said, the average, the average residence time for a lot of these ransomware attacks is on the order of weeks up to months. They take their time surveying your environment. They get a hold of your credentials. Their big goal, of course, is to get into Active Directory or IAM so that they can then start to poke into all of your environment. It's been striking the number of times we've, we've worked with companies that have said, you know, it feels like the ransomware attacker had a better understanding of where our critical data was than we in IT did. Like we didn't know that server was super important, but they exfiltrated it and compromised it, and we suddenly found out it was key to the business. They are taking their time looking around. And again, that's why it is so important to have those logs around, because they're just poking around little by little. 
That's why it's so important to do the review of who has access, because again, they've put in those permissions to allow themselves to, to look around. And that credential theft is what makes your backups exposed if you've got them in the same account. Because once they get that same account, they will set retention periods to zero. They will set versions to one or zero. They will delete backups. They will do everything they can because they know if you don't have a backup and they encrypt your data, you're paying because there's no other way to get your data back. So you have to assume at this point that if you're hit with ransomware, it's, you know, what you see on the surface is fine, but they've already gone way deeper than what you think and they've compromised your backup environment because they're smart. Now the second thing, uh, and this again ties back to that log piece, is there aren't enough logs. The logs rotate too quickly. The logs aren't protected off-site. Because by the way, I mentioned, they know that, that the backups are something you're going to lean on, so they try to delete your backups. Well, they know the logs are something you're going to lean on, so guess what? They try to go after the logs too. So we recommend that you back up your logs, you centralize your logs, you keep your logs in a separate location. Because when you need them, and you will need them, to do the forensics, to do the incident analysis, to be, to, to be able to actually track what's happened in your environment, they are going to be worth their weight in gold. And I'm always shocked by the number of people who say, yeah, but I don't really want to hold that much log data. For God's sakes, logs compress like crazy. Keep the logs. It is worth the money. The second piece that's really important is you know, to, to be able to then, in your backup environment, to detect when the bad things started to happen. You can see that in your backups. You can see when odd file extensions show up in your backups, when the entropy of your backups show that a bunch of encryption was happening. Really useful to be able to get the logs of what changed from backup to backup to backup, so you can actually see, ah, this server got hit, then they moved out this way, et cetera, et cetera. And then the third thing, always remember, you need a sandbox environment. The number of organizations that I've worked with that said, all right, so we got hit with ransomware, and we're still sort of doing our incident response, but we need to start restoring. OK? Where are you going to restore to? Well, we're going to restore back into the, oh, can't restore into the data center, because that's still infected, or at least certainly it hasn't been uh, unquarantined. So where am I going to restore to? And so they end up saying, well, we need to build some sort of secure sandbox. Now, I will tell you, the best time to build a secure sandbox is before you're hit with a ransomware attack. Because if you're building it afterwards, that's a really tough time to be under that kind of pressure. The second thing I'd say, especially whether you're running on-prem or in cloud, a cloud-based sandbox makes a lot more sense. Because you don't want to have a whole bunch of gear and equipment sitting by for months, doing nothing, waiting for an attack. If you use cloud and you have, you know, whether it's a CloudFormation script or Terraform or however you like to do it, and you can spin up your sandbox, that's the better way to go. The other benefit to that, of course, is you can test, test, test. Because when the ransomware attack hits, I guarantee you, again, it won't be the data you expected. It won't be the data you tested on. It's going to be something else. So you're going to want to test. It won't be your best and brightest in the office at that moment in time. It's going to be someone junior and young that's trying to do this. You want to test. This has to be muscle memory. The second piece in this is think about testing you know, the most important application. When it comes to a ransomware recovery, I want to hear, guess, what's the most important application in a ransomware recovery? What's the first thing that most people end up having to recover? Anyone want to just, I won't make fun of you if you're wrong. <laughs> Not bad. Uh, Active Directory, because Active Directory has been compromised, so you are going to need to recover it. The number of people who have tested recovering Active Directory in the world at large, I think, is zero. It might be negative one. Test recovering your Active Directory. It seems silly, and you're like, oh, how bad? It's, it's, it's a different beast, and you want to have it as muscle memory. The second thing is you need to set expectations for your organization about what that kind of RPO looks like. Because the RPO from a ransomware attack and the RTO from a ransomware attack are dramatically different than for a regular recovery. 
Because when it comes to recovering that data, you are going to have to scan it to make sure there's no malware. You're going to have to look to make sure there's no files that are encrypted. You're going to have to put it through that sandbox before you do anything and put it back in your production environment. And so if they've got, you've got a four-hour SLA, and everyone just says, all right, open up the floodgates. Let's start piping the data in. The answer is, whoa, we're not ready for that. So upper management needs to understand, in the case of a ransomware attack, the RPORTO is, by definition, going to be different. They're going to have to accept it. And again, you want them to accept it before the attack happens, because explaining it to an irate general manager who's got some sort of product release that they need to ship at that moment is not a fun discussion. And again, the last piece is, again, workload-specific playbooks. It's going to be the workload you don't expect. So constantly rotate what you're testing. Then, of course, the last part, and, and this, is, this is the other discussion that comes up, is, all right, but when I'm compromised, it's the whole environment that's compromised, right? I mean, whether it's the data center and my Active Directory and all that's compromised, or my entire VPC is compromised. So this isn't just about recovering some EC2 instances or some, some EKS or, or, or some RDS. This is about recovering the environment. And so this is where you know, we advocate to our customers, look, look at something like Control Tower. Standardize, standardize, standardize. You know, customers, we recommend they run lots of accounts, again, for blast zone radius coverage. Control tower standardizes. The number of organizations I meet that have 27 different ways of doing the same sort of VPC, and they sit there and they go, you know, we really regret that. Really? That's shocking. It seems fun to keep finding different ways to, to build your environment. Standardize. Because not only does the standardization help in terms of keeping track of everything and running the same policies, but it helps when it comes time to recover because you've got well-defined environments that you can use, again, tools like ours to help you recover the entire environment. So the tools are out there for you to use. But of course, it only works if you've got people and process on your side. So again, just to recap, you know, step one, in your environment, you're going to want to make sure your data is backed up off-site in the cloud in a separate location under a separate account. That's the only way to make sure it's safe if your credentials are compromised. Second, when it comes to a ransomware attack, make sure, A, you've got that data off-site. B, that you've got the logs, you've backed up the logs, the logs are accessible. C, make sure that you can understand what's happening by looking at your backups to see how things spread. And of course, D, test your recoveries, have a standby sandbox, be ready for when this happens, because you don't want to discover under live fire. And then finally, standardize, standardize, standardize. It is the only way to combat the kind of chaos and entropy that's in your environment. And again, it will be a constant fight, and it's going to seem painful, but when the bad thing happens, you will be so grateful. But of course, you know, I've been speaking very much either from a very Druva-centric perspective or sort of generally across our customers. What I'd like to do now is bring up somebody that you know, lives this on a daily basis inside his specific company. So I'd like everybody to welcome to the stage um, you know, our friend from Amgen, David Jaffe. So David, why don't you first walk us through who's Amgen and why are you sure. so awesome? Well, thanks for uh, having me here and allowing me to talk about Amgen. Uh, we are a uh, biotech company, pharmaceutical company. We develop uh, drugs to treat cancer and inflammation, among other things. Uh, we are patient-centric. Uh, we're all over the world globally. We have uh, eight manufacturing sites and 40 or more uh, dedicated locations that do other things. And this is in multiple countries too, right? This isn't all U.S. Correct. Yeah. Correct. We're in the EU, we're in Asia, uh, Central America. And so, so this, this leads me into my first question. So you're, you, you, make, uh, you make medicines, you make drugs, you do it all around the world. So I've got to imagine there's probably a regulation or two you have to follow. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, yes, regulations everywhere uh, for different countries. Uh, it impacted our uh, Druva deployment. Where can we send data for long-term storage? What country can, uh, uh, is it allowed to go to if it's allowed to leave the country at all? Places right. like China, Russia, that was a real discussion point for us. And Druva and AWS had a solution for us. And, and, and so, so, you know, given regulation, so, so again, there's a million parts to any, any sort of regulation. 
me through the, the data part of it. So, so I mean, in, your data is key, right? You're, you're making drugs, you're, you're running this organization. So, so what are some of the, the I guess, the, the fears you have about what could have happen to your data? How, just broadly Sure, our intellectual freak property us out. is, it's really very important, right? It's a very competitive environment. It's also a, a very important business to be in, right? Saving lives. So uh, making sure that it's uh, not compromised, making sure that the data is ours and not someone else's really very important. We do things like, of course, simple things, encrypt the disk. Uh, we uh, make sure, we, uh, post-COVID world, who can print from home and who, who can't. Most can't, right? Because once you print that uh, piece of paper out, it's lost for good. We no longer have access to it. So our security team takes uh, our data, and uh, the endpoint team takes it very serious, protecting it. So, so that's interesting. I mean, the, the, the not being able to, to even print. So, so I guess from an organizational standpoint, how do, how do your users respond to that, right? Because I could just imagine someone comes to me and say, you can't print anything anymore. Well, darn it. I'm, I'm well, take a, you know, they're not yeah. thrilled about it. Uh, <laughs> if they have a business case, there is an exception process, uh, and, they, uh, and that's final. There we go. So uh, it's not, you know, security is not always convenient to users. That's why we make users change their password, right? <laughs> so not convenient. So, so, so then I want to, I want to walk through because you mentioned COVID, right? Mm -hmm. So, so people are working remotely more. So you got this hybrid working. So, so given you're in a regulated industry, but you have to be working in a hybrid world, how are you going about that? Because I think, you know. We're in the same position, right? Sure. You know, when do you force people into the office? How, how do you balance well, that? Well, you know, uh, it was a tough time, as it was for everybody. So luckily, right, so I, I've been with Amgen about three and a half years, right before the pandemic hits. And I was hired, in fact, my first project was Druva. Uh, and it was part of a larger strategy for uh, recovery, uh, ransomware recovery, or uh, some sort of infection, as well as uh, how do we handle device refreshes better? How do we get users working faster? Whatever the reason, right? So how do we get their data back? Uh, and thankfully, so uh, with Druva and with the Microsoft Autopilot service, we're able to uh, ship devices directly to users' home, have them enter in their uh, email address and password, uh, authenticate the device, make sure the device is known, and then they go through the enrollment process, receive their applications. One of the first applications that comes down is Druva, and if, it's, uh, if they have a backup, it will restore it. So, so, so yeah. So you're not having to re-image, you know. And yeah, we no longer and... needed a line of sight to domain controllers. Right. Thank, thank. <laughs> so that would have been a real problem in the uh, early days. That makes sense. So, so, so then Amazon Workspaces. How did, how does that tie into where you guys are going? What's, what's the sure. point there? So uh, we're, we're a large user of Amazon Workspace for people uh, around the world, uh, external workers, contract workers, uh, partners. Uh, they all get one of those instead of a physical device. Uh, and it has the same use cases as a physical device, right? Minus the VPN. So, so. so, so from, from your point of view, what were the, maybe what were the, were there trade-offs that you were worried about as you went into a workspace? As again, to your point, you know, security's never free. You know, was, was sure. there friction that people had with that? And uh, so from a workspace point of view, uh, it's easy enough to spin up, but how do you uh, update it? How do you go from uh, end-of-life OS to the next supported o OS for your organization, right? For us, it was destroy the old version and move the user to a new virtual device. Uh, Druva came in handy for that, right? So well, that was a primary use case for, for workspaces, which is if we're destroying your old device, Windows 1511 and moving you to Windows 1909, whatever the, the versions are, we'll automatically restore your data. Previously, it was uh, copy your data to OneDrive or wherever, and then copy it back down on your own, right? And call service desk if you need help. So now, you know, everybody loves the, the solution. Because so, it just works. Yeah. Right. right. So that makes sense. Are there, are there other cases where you've, you've had to do things to kind of reduce that user friction to get people, again, comfortable with, you know, again, balancing that security versus, versus you know, kind of the, the user experience? Uh, you know, it, it reduces the user, you know, we have user friction. That is actually a term, I'm, I'm sure it's a common term, but we use it all the time in our organization. How can we help users uh, not, you know, how can we not interrupt users? How can we make sure that they're able to do their job faster? 
uh, and get to the data they need, right? And this was one of it, right? Being able to restore data. So you have a break fix scenario, your device isn't working. We'll ship you a new device at your home, you'll have it overnight. You'll uh, enter your credentials in, you'll get your data back, you'll get your apps back, and you're, in, and you're off working. And that also is a similar scenario for ransomware. Right. So, so let's talk about that then, because, uh, yeah, so, so again, you, you, you came to us, you know, certainly that was some of it. Walk through sort of how you guys viewed ransomware, where Druva came in, right? Because I've, I've just spent the sure. last 30 minutes telling everybody so, that ransomware is coming to get them. So, so I, I just mentioned uh, I've been working with Amgen for about three and a half years. Uh, uh, one of the reasons why I was brought in was to, yes, deploy Druva because it was a part of the strategy to, uh, for uh, recovery from an infection. Um, so it's been a primary driver. Uh, uh, for us for a long, long time. Uh, and that's one way uh, we respond to the, the, the cyber threats out there. Uh, also gives us the ability to uh, uh, ensure that uh, we can back up the entire drive and do forensics on it, right? An investigative hold for whatever reason. Uh, they have the ability to access that, start a backup on their own restore it on their own. They don't need to contact my group or service desk or anybody else. They have their own security role and their own sandbox to play with uh, when they need, need to do that. So uh, federated search is great as well. There's uh, additional security groups that are using that to identify when was this file here and when is it no longer here uh, type of thing. And, and, and I know one of the things that some of our customers do and, and you know, don't, don't be freaked out, but, uh, but, but you know, I'm backing up all the users' laptops, all the users' data in this case. Um, and like you said, sort of the compliance group, the legal group, is able to look through it for violations without alerting the user to it. I sure. don't know if you guys... Uh... Well, you know, uh, they do, uh, we do have uh, an investigative team for a number of reasons. Um, uh, my understanding is they're open about it. If you're under investigation for whatever reason, they will contact you and say, you're under investigation for X, Y, and Z. Please hold the data that we're asking you for, and we're taking a backup of your, your drive, and whatever the, the case may be. But we're pretty open about it. It's, good. Uh, it's a great environment that way. That is, that so, is cool. Yeah. No surprises. OK, cool. And, and, then, and then I guess the, the, the last piece um, that, that I just wanted to, to sort of, you know, as, as, you, as you look at where Amgen is going, because again, you know, thousands of employees across the world. I guess, how do you how do you see sort of the the, the world evolving for you? What's 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 what what are the threats that worry you most? What keeps you up at night? Uh, well, it's, it's ransomware, right? So I, I go back 20 years or so in IT, uh, starting on help desk, and I remember Code Red. If, I don't know how many of you remember Code Red, but that was a a disaster uh, that took a long time because we were decentralized, just getting into that centralized, hey, here's SMS or a competitor to SMS from Microsoft. Uh, we didn't have that. So uh, ever since then, it's always been, how do, we, how do I help secure the environment, whether as an uh, internal employee or a consultant for Microsoft, it's always been, uh, how do I make sure that these devices are secure in the best way, so ransomware. I don't want to be part of uh, that. We have done tabletop games. We do have playbooks. Uh, we have a very strong leadership team and uh, engineers, both on the security side and on the endpoint side. Uh, I'm, it still keeps me up at night. I, I do not want that on my resume. I'm 100%, 100% with you. And, 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 and again, one, one of the things that I think is important here is, again, we were talking about those crown jewels, right? So, so, so as, 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 as organizations go, right, you've got data in VMs and databases and in cloud native and in SaaS applications and, and in your endpoints. And again, where's the number one spot where ransomware comes in? It's users. Users get fished. And so the, 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 often those endpoints are the starting point from when everything spreads. And so it's really important as you look at a holistic plan, as much as you look and go, oh my God, laptops again? Do I really have to worry about laptops? Because it is often patient zero, if you can have that starting spot, again, it makes you that much more efficient and effective at detecting, also that much more efficient and effective at being able to do your incident response. And so, 
I just want to walk through again, just reiterate, you know, what, what are the key takeaways? And, and, and for us, again, and this is me with my, I'm just trying to keep Druva itself secure, secure. Every day, what does our team think about? And you can start in this, anywhere on this, on this sort of circle, but, uh, you know, usually it's, all right, you know, we've got someone on the team whose entire world seems to be, go ask questions about what we're doing that is possibly wrong or that we're not efficient enough at, or that we're leaving ourselves exposed by. You need someone who is constantly probing that. You know, this is the guy on my team that the other day, two new AWS accounts were spun up, and within 30 minutes he said, hey, whoa, I saw two new accounts spun up in GovCloud. Was that intentional? And it was, but they didn't follow the right process. So you need somebody who is constantly watching. Because again, as good as the tech is, if you don't have someone passionate watching and you don't have someone making sure that the process evolves, you're going to find yourself exposed. And then the second one is, and then you have to assess the risks. Now, like all of you, I've got a list of risks as long as my arm keeps me awake all night, all, all weekend, of here's a million things that I should be doing. But you've got to prioritize. You've got to assess where that risk is going to be most painful. Again, for us, again, it does start at production. It starts at data, and it radiates outward. Again, that doesn't mean that all my attention focuses on the highest risk areas, but it does mean that I need to balance my time and my investment. And then the last part is don't just go in half-cocked. You know, the number of times someone on my team has come to me and said, well, this tool promised that it solves the problem. This is the magic ointment. This is the security tool that solves everything. This is it. If anyone is coming to you and saying, I have a tool that's going to solve all your problems, they're lying. There is no one tool that solves all of these problems. One, because you need the people in process, and two, because this is way more complicated than any one tool can handle. There's going to be an ecosystem of tools you build that fit into your environment with the people in process to support it. And so because this is a Druva-sponsored pitch, I do have to at least do one little Druva sales pitch for you, but I will make it fast. And this is really the heart of what we try to bring to our customers, which is you have a lot of data protect, you have a bunch of risks in front of you. And you've got a million things, a list as arm as you're long about security things you need to protect yourself from. What I want to do as Druva is I want to take at least the data protection part off your plate. You know, so, so similar to what we do with Amgen, I want to be able to sit there and have you say, look, this just works, and I can, I can cover the other 87 things I need to be covering. And the way I want to do that is I want to give you SLAs. I don't want to sell you technology and say, hey, this technology is going to solve all your problems, because it's not. But I want to tell you, this is a service, and I'm going to give you service, service levels, and if I don't match them, then I will pay you up to $10 million. And so these, ser these service levels include confidentiality. I mentioned, you know, we are not going to leak your data. I guarantee it. That when you get hit with ransomware, because it is off-site, in a separately managed account, constantly being monitored with no way for something to get in and run in that environment, if you are hit with ransomware, you are going to be able to recover a good copy of your data. But of course, for it to recover, I am going to guarantee that your backups are reliable. So that 99% success rate on your backups we will make sure that you have good, up-to-date backups. And because you may need to recover something 10 years from now, 20 years from now, it's IP, we're going to make sure that that data is durable so that you're going to be able to recover whatever you need, whenever you need. And of course, the service isn't very useful if it's not available, so we're going to guarantee it's available. But again, my goal here is for you to say exactly what David said, which is, look, this just works. This takes this pain point off my, off my problem list. It lets users do what they need to do. It minimizes the friction in my environment. And it helps me sleep just a little bit easier worrying about how I would do my ransomware recovery, at least, because I know you're there for me. And because we're tied into the ecosystem of vendors, because we tie in with your security infrastructure, not saying I'm replacing all that. I am not the one size fits all that solves all your problems, because that's a lie. But I will plug into your infrastructure so that you can play nicely with your security team. That is what we do. Now, of course, I've, I've, I, I say this. What I'd love for you to do is say, I want to see some beef behind that bull. So one. In the exposition hall, 2241, there's a big Druva logo over it. That's the Druva booth. If it doesn't say Druva over it, that's somebody else's booth. Don't go there. All right. So that's one. Two, there. Get a live demo. 
You know, walk through it. See, see if it does what it say it does. And hey, if you don't want to talk to people, because let's face it, people, you know, we're not always fun to hang around, you can just go to the website, see it there, try it out on your own. Go to Marketplace, download it, try it on your own. You don't even need to talk to human beings because, hey, we're in Vegas and we're tired of seeing other human beings for a while. You can go back to your room, you can play with it tonight, because, I mean, it's either that or gambling, right? So... So again, just, just in summary, you know, what I'd like to say is, look, it is a dangerous world out there. And there's a million things you're going to have to do and keep doing it and keep evolving to keep safe. It's the number one thing I think about on a daily basis. But with the help of the right people, with the help of the right process, and with the help of the right services, you can make your life just a little bit easier. I would love to be a part of helping you through that. And I'd just like to thank all of you in the audience. I'd like to thank David from Amgen for his time. And I would like to wish all of you, all of you a wonderful conference. And again, please come by our booth. We would love to meet you. But thank you very much, and have an awesome time. Good job.